Hello, everyone. Uh, so starting today, what I've decided to do is to uh, record all the chapters uh, in our Rebo curriculum. As you know, Rebo, Registered Insurance Broker of Ontario, uh, it's one of the uh, famous uh, licensing exam that many people would like to take, and uh, there are lots of jobs. So if you haven't watched my intro video on this, uh, please do so. So without any further ado, I'm just going to start recording uh, chapter one today. Let me just uh, share my screen uh, just to get the PowerPoint here so that you know which chapter I'm recording. And you should see uh, chapter one. And just to save some bandwidth, I'm also going to turn up the video. Okay, so basically what I'm going to do is to go in depth, step by step by step, page by page, paragraph by paragraph, the material that is contained in the IBAO's uh, Rebo material. So if you look at the intro, if you haven't listened to the intro video, please do so. Otherwise you'll be wondering where I'm reading from. So the chapters um, are dated January, 2011. And the, at the very bottom of the page, you will see IBAC slash IBAO, Insurance uh, Brokers Association of Ontario. So uh, this is the material that I'm using. And in fact, I put up a picture of some of the pages uh, of this particular resource that I'm using. So I'll be reading from page to page. So let's get started. So chapter one, page 1-1, one -one, introduction to general insurance. So a brief perspective, that's where we're gonna start. It says here, insurance is all about risk sharing since earliest times, people have demonstrated a willingness to pool their resources to help others in times of need. So this is the very premise of insurance. I'll give you a quick example. God forbid you have a fire in your home and it's a significant damage or water damage, whatever, you happen, whatever happened in your home, it's a significant damage. You may not have the money to fix the problem. What if a whole house is burned down, God forbid? Do you have the money? You don't, okay? So that's why you need insurance. Now the insurance company, they're not gonna spend, let's say your, your house is like a million dollars, okay? To rebuild it. Yes, they will spend the million dollars, but they're not going to spend the million dollars out of their own pocket because the insurance companies will go bankrupt if they did that right? So what they're going to do is they're going to rebuild your house and they're not going to increase your premium right away. They're not going to come and ask you for money or whatever. No, they will rebuild it. But then the money they spent on your house, it's being distributed. It's being shared by many other people probably living in your postal code. This is how insurance is really possible. You don't have the money Insurance company, they're not going to spend the money on their own. Okay, so this is called risk sharing. And so since earliest times, people were willing to pool their resources to help others, to helping each other. When So when somebody has a problem, they have a loss, then we take money from a, like a common pool of money that everybody contributed. And then we're going to help those people who have the need. Okay. So history suggests that as early as 5000 BC, the Chinese boat operators found it necessary to redistribute their cargoes to several boats as they approach treacherous rapids in the rivers. So what the, so this again, sharing, risk sharing. So they put their goods in many boats. So if one boat was lost, all the boat owners shared the loss and no one was wiped out completely. You can see the, the concept of sharing of uh, uh, others' problems as a common good, okay? Then merchants found it impractical to deal with exposures in su such as an uh, informal way. So the marine insurance was born. People bringing goods from, let's say, Europe to England, this, because this is where it all started, the whole insurance thing. And so the boats used to capsize uh, they were taken over by pirates. There was big losses happening. So people, the owners of these boats, they couldn't afford to 
you know, uh, bring all these things back on their own. So they shared for a common good. Everybody shared. And then they, when someone has a loss, the others will contribute. You get the point. Okay. So, I mean, you can't do it on your own. So you have to share it with others. So I'm still on page one here. It says, uh, the last paragraph, the birth of fire insurance is traced to London, England in September 1666. Oh, there are three sixes there. You know, it's not a good number. The number of the, um, I believe the number of the devil, 666, right? <laughs> anyway, an almond fire, just a small fire just started in the king's bake shop, nearly destroyed the entire city. Wow. Just in the bake shop, the fire started, it destroyed nearly the entire city of London. The next year, a London dentist began offering insurance against the risk of fire to selected dwellings in London. So anyway, I'm not going to read this whole thing. You can read it on your own. It's just a story about how insurance started after this huge fire. I know books have been written. I think even some movies were made on this uh, huge fire and how the insurance was started by a dentist for the first time. Okay, so over 200 general insurance companies other than Life and Health in Canada are operating right now. I think it's more than 200 from coast to coast. And you can see there's a lot of competition to sell insurance. And so this is just a little a brief history of insurance on page one. I'm on page two. At the top of the page two, it starts out with the five functions of insurance. This is a very important exam question. So I'm going to uh, give you an explanation as much as possible here, okay? The first function of insurance, the spread of risk, which we already alluded to, okay, just a minute ago. How the losses of a few people are shared among the many. So this is the first function, the primary function of insurance is to spread the risk because people don't have so much money to fix their house, you know, to rebuild the house when it's destroyed by fire. So they depend on others to share in their losses. Okay, so insurance can be viewed as a large pot into which all insured, maybe all customers, they place their premium. So when you buy a car, you call the insurance company, you get insurance. So what do you do? You just keep, the, keep on paying the premium every month or maybe paid once in a year, whatever it is. But then maybe you didn't make any claim for three, four, five years, but you still keep on making your premium payment. So the, the premium that you're paying, is go, it goes into a pool. So the manager of the pool is the insurance company. So they collect premium from tens of thousands of people. So what they do with the money is when someone has an accident, someone is hurt, their car is damaged, then they take money from the pool and they give it to them. This is the only way it's going to work because we don't have, we don't walk around with so much money in our pocket, okay? So this is the spread of risk. So this is in fact a major function of insurance is to spread of risk. So the second function is called the basic basis of credit system. Okay, let me give you a quick example, okay? So let's say you want to buy a car. You don't have the money. The car you're looking at is cost you about $40,000. So then what do you do? You have like $5,000 down payment. Okay, that's what you saved up. Then you go to a financing company. Let's say TD Auto Finance, Toyota Credit Canada, or Honda Canada Finance. What they do, they advance you the money. Of course, they're going to charge you some interest, but they advance you the, some money. So even though you don't have all the money, you're able to buy that car. But then the financing company, they're going to ask you for confirmation of insurance. So you have to tell your broker to prepare a confirmation of insurance coverage and send it to the financing company. They're going to put it in their file. Let's say, God forbid, you have an accident. Your car is written off as a total loss. Then the insurance company is going to cut a check, two checks. One for the money you still owe to the financing company and the rest will be for you in the final settlement. So the reason how the financing company, they decided to give you the money is because of the availability of insurance. Because they don't know whether you, are, you have so much money to repay them if the car is a total loss, but they can rely on the insurance company. You see how the insurance functions here as a basis of credit system. So in the middle of the page, there is a example here involving Bert and Betty. 
So you better get used to them because we're going to spend a lot of time with uh, Bert and Betty. I mean, uh, Bert is not a, you know, he's one of my favorite guys because he's a troublemaker. Okay. So as we go along, you will see he's, uh, he's a very mischievous guy. He gets into trouble and puts Betty into trouble too. But anyway, we will we'll just uh, we'll keep that in mind. Okay. So Bert and Betty Butler live in Yorktown. Like most Canadians, they have had to use loans to finance their purchase of their automobile, just like how I explained it. Okay, also for their home, they have to get a mortgage. And if they want to start a business, they have to go and get a loan. But then these people giving the banks, giving the loan and the banks providing the mortgage, they're not just going to give um, to Bert and Betty, just trusting them. They may not even uh, know them. But then they, if they show proof of insurance, yes the banks are more willing to give uh, the mortgage or the financial company the loan for the car, okay? So you can see immediately how insurance is so helpful as a basis of credit um, system. Okay, the third function is called the eliminates worry. Uh, this is pretty straightforward, okay? Now, uh, you, buy, you just bought a car. Can you just drive it without insurance? At least not in Canada. I know in some countries in the world, uh, you can just drive the car uh, without uh, insurance. Even you just go down to the state of Virginia and the US, uh, there's no need for insurance, but you have to file a bond, okay? But in Canada, insurance is mandatory. So what do you do immediately when you buy, as you see, purchase a car? You have to get insurance, why? Because if you don't have insurance, you have an accident, you hurt somebody, you cause bodily injury to somebody else, you will be in big trouble. Are you buy, you just bought a home? Well, a, a hundred different things can happen to your home. Somebody can break in, a tree can fall on, fall on your home during a windstorm, you could have water damage, you could have a fire. So you can see there's so many worries uh, that you have as soon as you own the property. So insurance takes away all those worries. Why? As soon as you bought your home, you call the insurance company and you get coverage, you pay them premium, so the water damage or fire damage, you just make a phone call. You make a claim. They come and fix it. So all your worries have been taken over by the insurance company and in return, you're paying them premium. So this encourages people to even start businesses. They take even some people, they take risk and because there's insurance. If something went wrong, you know, you can, um, you have insurance to fall back on and you can take a loan and the bank is, um, looking at your insurance coverage and they say, okay, if something goes wrong, then, uh, you know, they have uh, the insurance to pay for that. So the availability of insurance allows people to engage in many ventures without having to set money aside to meet the financial requirements, like buying a car, buying a home, uh, starting a business, all of that. You're going into those things and you enjoy your life by having, uh, possessing these things and running a business without having to worry about it so much. Oh my God, something went wrong. Uh, what am I gonna do? Where's, I don't have the money. No, that's why you buy insurance. So by making a small defined expenditure, which is called the premium, to cover the large but uncertain future losses, all you have to do is pay your premium to the insurance company. And then if and when something happened, the insurance company will come and fix it for you. The fourth function of insurance called the loss prevention and loss reduction. So what is loss prevention, loss reduction? What's the difference? Loss prevention is that, let's say you're running a factory. What you can do to prevent the loss even from happening, you can install a sprinkler system. You can install a security system. Okay, to, uh, you know, if somebody is breaking into your place, you have a high-end security system. And so you can prevent some of the losses. The loss reduction is if and when a loss does happen, how you can reduce it, okay? So you, you can take some precautions now and you can, even when the loss does happen, you can reduce the loss. So the insurance company, not only they provide you coverage, they also, um, they can give you consultation. Uh, it says here the insurance industry works hard to prevent them and to reduce their severity. And so active uh, partnerships have been formed with the communities and public officials. So this is an, an extended function of insurance. So not only they provide insurance coverage, they also have uh, public education, town halls. You know, you can even 
uh, engage them to do a risk management assessment of your business, all of that, okay? And also they, they try to do whatever they can to prevent fraud, okay? So the last function, the fifth function is source of employment. Well, I'm employed in the insurance industry and uh, you know it's very difficult to lose your job in the insurance industry. Even during COVID, our industry was considered to be essential industry, okay? And today, we are finding so hard in, a, in, a, in the broker that I, where I work to recruit people, to get people with Rebo. We can find them. There's nobody with Rebo available. So we are finding it hard and people are switching jobs. There are so many jobs available. So the insurance industry is a, a huge employer of uh, you know people in, uh, in Canada. And see, this book was written in 2011. So don't rely on the number here. I'm on page three. It says 100,000 people. I'm sure today it's probably like quarter of a million or even more people are working uh, in the insurance industry in Canada, okay? It's a huge source of employment and investment capital, okay? So insurance is a big business. So claims total into billions of dollars. And so what happened? The assets controlled by the insurers amounted to more than 88 billion in 2003. And now here is 2023, okay? So if history is an indication, this amount will double in 10 years. So they were saying that in 2003, and we are after 20 years, is probably tripled, okay? And so even if you look at the page of top three, it says here, Canadian insurance employ our contract services from more than 100,000 people, including independent brokers, adjusters, actuaries, and all of those people working in the industry. And also, we involve a lot of different professions. Let's say a home is destroyed by fire. The insurance company has to have their contractors, plumbers, electricians, so on and so forth, okay? Uh, construction, and also people who, who get injured in car accidents. So many companies, they employ nurses, doctors, you know, all kinds of, then if somebody gets sued, let's say an insurance company, their client is being sued in the court, then they need lawyers and accounting. So you can see insurance company, you know, they employ all kinds of people in the industry. Okay, I think we made the point here that insurance is a huge source of employment. So now on page three, uh, the second part of page three here, it uh, is defining the insurance. Basically, what we said is the insurance company, they make a promise. In other words, they take an, uh, they, it's an undertaking by the insurance company uh, make by making a promise to the customers that, okay, you pay me the premium every month. And then if and when something went wrong, in your home or in your car, if you had an accident, or you had a fire damage in your home, we will come and fix it for you. That's a little explanation in like a thumbnail version of explanation of insurance, okay? So the official version, it says the undertaking by one person to indemnify another person. So what the meaning of indemnify means to reimburse, to pay for the loss, to send them a check for the loss. That's indemnify, okay? So what is the undertaking is like a promise made by one person in the insurance company to indemnify another person, the customer, against loss or liability, whether they have a fire damage in their house or whether they're being sued because they injured somebody in a car accident and they, they're being sued by somebody. In either cases, the insurance company will respond to that. Uh, in terms of a certain risk of peril, risk of peril means a peril means uh, something that causes a loss, like a fire, water damage, theft. You know, those kind of things are called peril. So they cause a loss. So if one of the perils affected the insurance home, then the insurance company will step forward and they will pay for that. They'll indemnify that. Okay. So keep that in mind. They will pay a sum of money or other thing of value upon the happening of a certain event. Like a fire, water damage are good examples, right? and they will pay you the money or they get the contractors out there and they will fix the problem. So an anal analysis of the definition of insurance reveals the following five important points. So if you look at the, the definition we just uh, explained a minute ago, uh, how insurance company, they, they make a promise, they, they have an undertaking 
and with the public and they collect the money uh, as a premium and then in return, they indemnify the people. So this is the e explanation of insurance. So it has five important points. One, insurance provides a means of shifting one's financial responsibility for a loss to another party. Like we said before, you bought a home and then you're so worried about something may happen, like a tree falls on your home or something like that, a lightning hit your home. You don't have the money to fix it. So you're worried. What you're doing is you are shifting that all that financial responsibility, if something happened to your home, to the insurance company. That's number one. Number two, payment will be made only in the event of the happening of a certain risk of peril. I mean, you cannot just make a claim uh, for, for, you know, without any proof of something happened. The insurance company, either they pay you or they send their contractors to fix the problem, but you have to show them uh, through a proof of loss form what exactly happened. It has to be because of an event of happening of a certain risk of peril, okay? So there shouldn't be any fraudulent claims, okay? And so it's here, uh, I'm on page four. The insurance uh, meaning given to risk is the chance of financial loss. The second thing with the insurance is that very important, whatever happened to your house, it should have happened by chance. It's not the something that you expected. If you don't maintain something, it's going to break down. You have to expect that, oh, okay, I haven't been spending time or money in maintaining something. Even your house, if you don't do your proper upkeeping, it's going to start breaking down, right? You have to uh, replace your roof or, you know, whatever it is, the wiring after so many years, they're going to become old. If you don't, then it's going to create a fire. So the insurance companies, when you make a claim, they're going to find out whether the loss happened suddenly and accidentally or it's something that you neglected and then now the loss happened and they may deny the claim because everybody you take your responsibility what you're supposed to do okay so the point here is that insurance will only cover things that happen by chance okay And so as a result of common usage, risk has also come to mean the object of insurance. So the word risk is used in the insurance industry as a noun or as well as, as an adjective, okay? So uh, an adjuster will say, or an underwriter will say, oh, I will not accept that risk. It has too, so many problems. Their house is too old. I'm not gonna accept that risk. So in that sense, she is using the word risk to refer to the house or a car, oh, I'm not going to touch that risk because the car is so old. It had pre-existing damages, you know, it's, I'm not going to touch that, I'm not going to accept that risk. So you can see the word risk is being used to refer to the subject matter of the insurance contract. What's the subject matter? What is being insured? Why are you getting insurance for? What, what is that? Oh, it says your house, your car, your business. So that's the subject matter. So the, the word risk, sometimes it refers to the subject matter of the insurance policy. So we already said that the peril is simply defined as a cause of loss, like fire, water damage, windstorm, hail, all of those are called perils, okay? They can cause a loss. All right, the third point here on page four, the amount of the payment is restricted to the amount required to indemnify the insured. So basically what they're saying is, don't make fraudulent claims. If something happened, just make the claim for whatever is destroyed. Okay, don't, don't you know, do frauds. That's exactly what it is, okay? So um, this is called the principle of indemnity. What the principle of indemnity is that whatever you lost, you make a claim and then you're gonna be reimbursed for that. You're gonna be indemnified for that. So don't make, uh, you know, inflated claims. Don't make up a claim, okay? And so you should only receive the actual amount of your loss no more or no less, okay? All right, so let's go to page five here. At the top of page five in the box, it says amount of indemnity is de determined by value of property immediately prior to loss. So how do you know how much was lost? So then you have to look at the property before the loss happened, how much the customer uh, paid for it, or if it's based on actual cash value, how much it's worth today, and all of that, okay? And then 
that was lost in a fire. So now insurance company knows how much to pay the customer. So here's the example. The butlers purchased their home for $175,000 10 years ago. Today it is worth $250,000. If their home was to be destroyed by an insured peril like a fire, the actual amount of their loss would be $250,000 because it's worth $250,000 today. As with all property losses, it is the value of the property as it existed immediately prior to its loss that formed the basis of the complete indemnity. Okay. So in my opinion, this is not a very good example because we don't take into consideration how much a house is worth in terms of the buying and selling price. Okay. A home located in downtown Toronto, uh, like a, let's say 2,000 square feet home is uh, costing $2 million dollars where the same size home is located up north, far away from the city, it could be just maybe $300,000, okay, the same size. So what the insurance company is um, going to look at is how much money it'll the insurance company will require to rebuild the house. So it's called the rebuild value. So regardless of the market value of the house, we look at the rebuild cost because the market value could fluctuate uh, due to supply and demand. So a lot of people are, let's say, coming to Canada, and I believe they double the uh, amount of people they're going to bring into Canada. So when people come in and they're looking for a house, okay, looking for a place to stay. So there's a lot of people coming in and there are fewer houses available to buy. The price is going to shoot up, right? So that's not what the insurance company is looking at. They are looking at, depending on the size, how many stories, even how many car garage they have, where, you know, um, whether they have a basement, if it's a finished basement or not, how old is the house, all of that. And then if this house is completely destroyed by a fire, how much money we will need to rebuild it. So this is the amount we are looking at, okay? All right, so point number four, insurance covers losses to which the object of insurance may be exposed. So the, what is the object of the insurance is? It's a car or a home, your business, that's called object. So the purpose of insurance is to pay for those losses which are both accidental and future. We said that already. It shouldn't be something that you were expecting to happen. It should be accidental and it, sh it, should, have have, it should happen in the future. Okay, we're not gonna look at some loss that already happened some time ago, right? It should happen in the future also it is not intended to respond to losses which are deliberate or which have already occurred. So let's say a customer went home and he had some problem that day. He lost his cool. It's happened, actually, I'm giving you an actual example. One of our customers did that. So he went home. He was in a very bad mood. So he took a hammer. I think he has an argument or something with the, the spouse or something like that. He took a hammer and he just broke down an entire wall with a hammer, he was so angry. And he said he felt good after that. <laughs> you know, after he broke down <laughs> the wall. And then they made a claim <laughs> to fix that. So the adjuster went there from our company and he asked them a simple question. Okay, how did it happen? They will always ask you this question. How did this happen? How the wall <laughs> completely broke down? And he said, ah, oh, you know, my husband came home and he was in a good mood. <laughs> we had a little argument. And then he just took a hammer and just, we said, no way, we're not going to cover this. No, insurance is not for that. So that's what it says here in the box. It is not intended, not in the box, actually the number four here on page five. It is not intended to respond to losses which are deliberate, okay, or which have already occurred. If the loss already occurred in the past, you know, you, you cannot make a claim. Let's say somebody did not have insurance and they had a loss and now they're buying insurance to cover the loss that just happened, but they didn't have insurance. No, we're not going to cover that. Losses have to happen after you have the policy, not before. <laughs> okay. All right. You know, our industry could be, sometimes it could be funny. We have all kinds of people. So deliberate losses and losses which are already occurred are not insured. As deliberate losses re represent a waste of human and other resources, society does not support paying for them. <laughs> and also sometimes people will attempt to purchase insurance after losses already occurred. 
that's not also not allowed. I mean, we will give them insurance, but we will not cover the loss that happened before. We'll ask them to fix it and send us proof of repair that that problem has been fixed so that they won't make a claim in the future. That's kind of standard practice, okay? All right, so moving on, I'm at the bottom of page five. The insurance company always has the right to settle a claim on the basis of repair or replacement as opposed to payment of money. So basically what they're saying is when you make a claim, let's say it would have fire and some of the couches were burned down, so your kitchen countertop is burned down or whatever it is, and you made a claim. So the insurance company, they have the right to bring their contractor because they have the preferred contractors, okay? They give them warranty and everything because the insurance company, they give a lot of business, like millions of dollars worth of business to the contractor. They get good service. So they will decide to fix it themselves, insurance company. Or uh, they will try to uh, repair it or replace it. They have the choice. If something is so badly damaged, so it's not worth uh, repairing it, they will just throw it out and put in new stuff. But if something can be repaired, yes, the insurance company, they have a choice to do that. Okay, you cannot always demand, oh no, I want new items. That's not gonna work, okay? And also, they may also settle cash with you. If, you, if they think that, okay, that's, that's a good idea to give you cash, but then they need proof of repair that you didn't take the cash and go to Florida for a vacation, you did the, you know, you fixed the loss that happened. <laughs> okay, that's why insurance company will need proof of repair. Okay, so that's at the bottom of page five. Going to page six, at the top of page six, we are reading here in the box, insurer may opt to repair versus cash settlement. I'm not gonna read that. I already mentioned that to you. They have the option, insurance company have the option to either to repair through their own contractors or to give you cash. Okay, you can negotiate with them. You know, the adjusters are good people. And, you know, they, let's say you know a contractor, you're within your family, you have a very nice contractor there, and they're used to construction. And you say, you think that, you know, that'll be better for you than the insurance company people come and repair. Yeah, you can negotiate with the adjuster. It's possible to get a cash payout, okay? So, property and casualty insurance in Canada. Uh, this is pretty straightforward on page six. So we're starting up with the automobile. Automobile insurance is the largest, the largest insurance in Canada. Give me one second here. Okay, so in the US, the same thing, automobile, because everybody's driving a car. Some families have so many cars in one family, right? So this is the largest single class of property and casualty insurance in Canada. Then property, of course, the second in line here, it's also known as the habitational and business property. So why it's called habitational? This is where you make your habitat. But this is where you live. That's what's called habitational. Insurance and business properties represent the second largest. Then the liability. What are the liabilities? When your customer gets sued, when you get sued, your, your policy already automatically has, whether it's an automobile, policy or homeowner's policy, the, the uh, habitational policy or your business policy, they all have liability insurance. Why? Because people are getting sued left, right, and center. There's so many lawsuits going on in North America, especially, I don't know much about other countries, but here there's so many lawsuits going on. So all these policies, they automatically include liability coverage. Okay, now we're gonna say a few words about high level, some of the organization of insurance, different types of companies. So I'm on page seven here. So insurance in Canada is distributed by two distinct types of organizations. Okay, one is the private companies and the other one is called the government insurers. Very simple for the exam, okay, private company. So the private company have two different types. One is called a stock company. A stock company, the main purpose of a stock company is to make a profit. So they sell shares to the public, and though we have, they have shareholders, and so that's the main purpose, to uh, to make a profit. And uh, so they collect this private funds or through public sale of stock. It could be the private funds, investors, or they sell the, you know, like in the stock exchange, like New York Stock Exchange, Toronto Stock Exchange, so on and so forth. And they collect uh, capital from the public and they run the company. And the mutual companies, their main motive is not to make a profit. Well, their main motive is to help each other mutually. 
Okay, so that's why the companies, the mutual company, they are not owned by, uh, you know, like um, big corporations and, uh, but the mutual companies are owned by the members, their own members. In some book, they call them as subscribers, okay, or policy holders. They own the company. So the profit making is not a primary incentive for them. Instead, the main goal of the mutual companies is to provide policyholders with insurance at as low cost as possible. That's the main motive. Then the government insurance, both the federal and provincial governments are involved in providing various insurance planning. For example, uh, medical insurance, employment insurance, workers' compensation, all of that provided by the government. If you go to the Western provinces, British Columbia, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, and Quebec, the basic automobile insurance is provided by the province, not by private industry. They allow the private industry only to sell extra coverage. What are some endorsements, rental cars, so on and so forth. But the governments in these three provinces, and the Quebec has a kind of a odd system. It's not an odd. It's a different system compared to any other province called dual system. But the three provinces, BC, Manitoba, and Saskatchewan, they have similar protocol that the basic insurance will be provided to all the residents by the government, okay? So those are the two major uh, providers of insurance, private and government. So I'm on page eight. Introduction to general insurance. Uh, uh, this is the chapter one we are going through, page eight. How insurance is distributed. So how the insurance company, they are selling their insurance to the public. So some insurance company, they set up a call center like TD Insurance, Bel Air Direct, and then they contact the public directly. They market the product directly to the public. So the public, they call them. It's usually a call center. And there's a whole bunch of people working there. So I worked for TD Insurance for eight years. So I know how the direct writer works. Now I work for a broker, okay, brokerage. So I, I, I'm aware of both situations, brokerage and direct writing. So in the direct writing, people deal with the insurance company directly and they call the call center, they set up the policy and if they want to make a change, they call the same place, okay? That's called direct writing. And so the people working there, they could be called employees, brokers, okay? So they are very different from independent brokers. We're going to see them in a moment. So the people working for the direct writing companies, they probably get a salary and maybe a commission or a bonus at the end of the year. Okay. Okay. Now moving on to independent brokerage system, there are over 7,000. This is in 2011. They're writing this. Okay. 7,000 independent brokerage insurance offices in Canada, employing over 30,000 people. So it could be double or even more than double today. Okay. So the brokerage owners are not employees of insurance. In most cases, they choose to represent more than one insurance company. So who is a broker by definition? It could be an independent person having his or her own office. And they're working with many companies, many insurance companies, more than one company. So they work with the public. So let's say you just bought a car and you know a broker through a friend. And then you call the broker and you say, hey, I just bought a car and I'm looking for coverage. So this broker will uh, get quotes for you. He'll connect to Whoever, uh, whichever company he's working with, he or she's working with, and he will do quotes with all these companies. Now, we are working with about 25 companies in our brokerage. So when the customers call us to get a policy, we do quotes with all these companies, and we find the best coverage for the best price for our customer. So the customer does not contact the insurance company directly in a broker management system. They contacted the broker. So the broker is contacting the insurance company to get a quote. So they get a commission for placing the business with that insurance company. If the quote is uh, okay with the customer, the customer says, okay, let's go with the policy. And the, uh, the broker is putting the customer with, let's say, ABC insurance company. And the ABC insurance company, uh, they pay the bro brokerage uh, a commission and the brokerage will pay the commission to the independent broker. Okay, so they're not like employees. That's why they're called independent. So the agency system, at the bottom of page eight, while brokerage and agency are often used interchangeably, agents are distinct from brokers and direct writers. How? 
because agents they mainly work for one company in some book they write the maximum two companies i'll go with the one company to make it easy okay one company like a state form state farm insurance they have exclusive agents they don't work for any other company they only work for state farm they may have their own office okay and so it all depends on the commission level whether they're going to be paid any office expenses or whether they're going to be paid any salary and all of that will be discussed between the broker the i should say agent and the brokerage they're going to work for at the beginning is this called the agency agreement it's like just like an employment contract okay and then they will decide the commission level and everything and that's it so even here they they show state farm and cooperators has uh, examples of agency system okay so what i'm going to do i'm just going to pause the recording because i just have to attend to a very important i just got an email here from my uh, manager. So let me just pause the recording just for a few minutes. Hey everyone, sorry, I just had to break for a few minutes to take an important call and uh, hopefully the recording continues here. I resume the recording. Okay, I'm on page nine of chapter one. And it just goes through an explanation of Lloyd's of London, one of my favorite uh, topics to discuss. I'm not going to read this whole thing, but I'll just give you a little bit of explanation about it, and you can read this page. Lloyd's, it's so big, it started, I don't know, in the 16th century, whatever it is, and, uh, oh, late in the 17th century. And so Edward Lloyd's is just a little coffee shop, and he was working with the merchants, bringing goods from Europe to England, and that's what started. And today, Lloyd's is not even called a company. It is so big around the world that's called a Lloyd's Insurance Market. <laughs> okay, so Lloyd's Insurance Market, and um, so it does not transact an insurance business itself, but rather it uses what they call syndicates. So syndicates is a groups of like thousands of brokers and brokerages put together all over the world. They get the risk from the public and from corporations and companies, and they send it on to uh, Lloyd's. And uh, so they work with uh, the syndicates, through the syndicates. And if you want to work with, we have, we hired somebody from Lloyd's um, uh, just uh, two years ago. Very nice man and very knowledgeable. So they have to get their license, uh, a Lloyd's license to, to work for Lloyd's, uh, right risk for Lloyd's. They have their own qualification process and everything. And uh, you can read this page. Um, then there's something about the slip. There are several non-underwriting members who act as broker intermediaries for various law syndicates. So you can see they, there's a chain of people working for Lloyd's and it's so big, the, the, the Lloyd's uh, insurance market all over the world. So you have to have a, a group of brokers working with another group of brokers. They work with the syndicate and the syndicate uh, goes to Lloyd's to get coverage. There are a lot of middle people involved here because it's so complex, okay? And so um, there's something called a slip here. Um, the slip is just the, the underwriting commit uh, commit to a certain percentage of a total limit of liability and when 100% of the risk is subscribed, the slip is forwarded to the policy. So let's say, I'll give you a quick example. A ship is carrying tons and tons of cargo from Japan to the US. And so ultimately, uh, you know, that ship has to be insured. All the cargo and everything. You can just imagine how many millions of dollars worth of stuff is, has to be insured. So it's not going to be like one company is going to take out all the risk. There'll be several companies involved in taking the, the risk. The, the ship itself has to be insured, the cargo and the people and all of that has to be insured. So a few companies will be involved and they will work with brokerages, big brokerages. And the brokerages will work with syndicates who are licensed to work with Lloyds. And ultimately, Lloyds will get a part of that. Not the whole risk is going to come to Lloyds, but, you know, they may get a big portion of the Lloyds will insure this huge uh, things. So when they have this, everybody figured out who is going to deal with who, who is taking how much of the risk of the ship, the percentages and all of that. So when they give the full picture, 
That is called, they have the slip. <laughs> I don't know why they call the slip. I mean, I know why they call the slip, because when Edward Lloyd was just a, had a coffee shop in the 17th century, what he used to do, he, the merchants bringing goods from England, uh, sorry, from Europe to England, they used to lose their ships to pirates and, you know, capsizing accidents and everything, and they were just losing a lot of money. So there were, there were some rich people who used to come to the coffee shop of Edward Lloyd's. He owned the coffee shop like Starbucks, okay? And what these rich people, they, they had a lot of money, the aristocrats. And then the merchants will come also to Lloyd's Coffee Shop, some of them, and they were so worried and they're talking about it. So make a long story short, the rich people, they collaborated with the merchants and they told them, okay, how would we insure your ship coming from, uh, from Europe to England? And then we are like uh, five of us here. We will just take a percentage of each. And we uh, we just together, the five of us, will take over the whole ship. And then if something goes wrong to your ship on the way, then we will give you the money. And in return, you give us a premium, something like that, like a commission, a premium. That's how it started. And then they will take a Lloyd's. You know, his job is so funny. His job is to provide them the ink and a small piece of paper, and they will write down, okay, Jim Jones will take 10%. And then, uh, you know, Edward will take this, and uh, Peter will take this one. And then they put 100%, and each of them will sign their name, under each their name, and the percentage they're going to take. And that's where the, the term underwriting came from. Under their name, they will sign. Okay, I will take this much risk of the ship. So that little piece of paper that Lloyd's gave them with the ink and the, where they wrote their name, this is called the slip. This is where the, the, the word slip came from. So now that slip today, it's a magazine. <laughs> it's a whole Lloyd's magazine because they, they move so much of cargo around the world, billions of dollars worth of cargo on a daily basis. They had to make that slip is now like a whole Lloyd's magazine, okay, where you can find all these things. And anyway, I didn't want to take into that conversation, but I couldn't help myself, okay? Moving on to page 10. Purchasing an insurance policy from a broker, new business. How do you go about buying a policy, okay? So when a client enters a broker's office to purchase an insurance policy, there are several steps that should be followed. So you just bought a car, okay? And then the traditional way, now let's say the, you know the broker's office, and then you went to his office. Okay, so what the broker has to do? Well, the, <laughs> the client should be greeted. Oh, hi, Mr. Jones, uh, you know, come on in. What happened? You bought a car today? Uh, sure, yeah, take a seat, you know, something like that. Very professionally... You have to greet them. And then the application should be completed. Okay, Mr. Customer, I'm going to pull out the automobile application. I'm going to ask you a bunch of questions. And then, of course, how, how would you like to pay? The payment, okay? So I'm not going to spend too much time here. This is just simple, okay? And the next one, the brokerage issues a policy. Okay, so here is your policy, Mr. Customer, okay? And the, a copy of the application and the policy is given to the customer. And the brokerage does not issue the policy. The application is sent to... Uh, the company, if the brokerage, they don't, they are not the one to issue the policy. And remember, the brokerage is like a middle person. Behind them is the insurance company who actually does cover the risk, okay? Because when a claim happens, you, you're actually calling the bro the insurance company. And some brokerages, they're given the authority to process some claim, but for the most part, it's left to the insurance company, okay? So the customer probably knows the broker, that's where he went to his office, but the broker is dealing with the insurance company to get the policy, okay? So if the broker is authorized to issue the policy, he will do it. If not, he will contact the insurance company to get the policy to the customer by mail. Now I'm on page number 11. So let's say one year has passed, usually the policy of a 12 months period, okay? Now one year has passed, so the policy has to be renewed now. So in most cases, it is more expensive to put new business on the books than it is to renew it. Basically, what they're trying to say is, it is always a good idea to keep your existing customers. Regardless of what business you're doing, whether you're selling insurance, uh, uh, you know, selling cupcakes, you have a restaurant, 
you need to keep your customers. You need to make them come back to you. Why? Because you're spending so much less time and less money with the existing customer and you still keep making money from them than to get new customer. So new customer is not easy. Do the marketing, you have to go and find them, you have to in, you go and meet with them and everything. So it's always more expensive to get new business. So you, sh you should try to retain your existing client as much as possible. So the renewal process begins when the expiration list are distributed. What is the meaning of expiration list? Because you will see that in many um, in tax in the insurance, it is just the a list of policies that are about to expire after a period of 12 months. That's all it is. So let's say you're a brokerage and then the insurance company will send you a list of the expiration list and they will say, okay, guys, uh, there are about 10,000 policy. They're going to expire within uh, two months. So usually the renewal process will start about two months before because even by law, the customer should receive the renewal about 45 days before their renewal. Because they should have enough time to, if they want to shop around to go to a different company, they should be given enough time. So the usual, the threshold, the number of days we follow in the industry is about 45 days, okay? So that means the brokerage will get the renewal list, expiration list, at least two months before uh, the renewal of the policy. And so the brokerage, if it's a commercial client, they will call them, they'll go through the policy and see if there's any changes took place in the commercial and the business and everything. And the personal line, not much to be done there. They just send it over to the uh, customer to renew the policy. That's called the expiration list, okay? I just want to tell you what it is. And so um, it says here, tenant and automobile, tenant and homeowners policy, they are automatically renewed. Because there's not so much customers driving the same car and, you know, the risk is the same. So why you have to look at every single automobile risk? You'll be wasting your time. Okay. Um, all policies should be reviewed prior to the, uh, to the renewal date. What this uh, suggestion here, I'm on top of page 11, even though most of the policy like automobile, tenant and homeowner, they renewed automatically, it just says here that all policies should be reviewed prior to the renewal date, you know, just to make sure that the, the coverage is good and that nothing has changed with the customer. They're doing the same business. They're not selling something new, whatever it is, okay? So they say the policy should be reviewed. So it is important that someone from the firm contact the insured prior to the issuance of the renewal. I just mentioned that. It's always a good idea to call them uh, prior to the renewal to find out if something changed on their side and also tell them the premium and you know just to have a conversation with them it's always a good idea to have a good report with the clients uh, most brokerages will do this as much as 2 or 3 months prior especially for commercial okay so also in many cases coverage may be uh, may need to be added or deleted so this is in the commercial situation maybe they are uh, what if they took over another company what if they are, they are selling a new product all of that okay so sometimes yeah, some coverage have to be added, a new coverage. And then the policy either has to be endorsed, endorsement to make a change to the policy, or completely canceled and rewritten. What that means is the, the existing policy will not be sufficient to, for the new risk because the company now completely, uh, they're doing something different, okay? So now we may have to cancel the policy, what they have now, and create a new policy a new endorsements, new changes and everything, okay? So all this is possible. We're not saying that we are going to be doing this all the time, but all this is possible. And so many insurance companies that provide the brokerage with a renewal listing, I already mentioned it to you, it's called expiration list. And most bro brokers have developed their own renewal listing and checklist. Okay, so it all depends what the practice followed by the brokerage is, whether they are the one to renew the policy so this is called agency agreement. So a brokerage or a broker, they're working with an insurance company, okay, or with many insurance companies. So before they start their business relationship, they will sit down and they will craft, they will draft the agency agreement, the commission, and whether they're going to handle some claims and who will prepare the renewals for the customers, all of that will be discussed. So it could be the insurance company or the brokerages, okay? And... After client contact is made, the renewal decision have been made. I'm on the bottom of page 11 here. 
the renewal is requested from the insurer. Okay, where I work in my brokerage, we don't do this. We don't renew the policies. The, all the policies are, policies are renewed for, for the customers by the insurance companies. And they actually send them directly to the uh, customers and then they send us a copy at the same time. So if a customer calls, they don't call the insurance company. They call us because we got the customer for the insurance company. Uh, so they will call us and say, hey, I just got the renewal documents from your insurance company, from the insurance company, and there's something wrong here. Okay, there's something is missing or the coverage is not correct or whatever it is. So they call us and we have a copy in our system from the insurance company. So we can pull up the copy and say, oh, okay, I'm on page six. And then uh, can you explain me the coverage? So we do that. Okay, we explain. And if there's a problem, we contact the insurance company as a brokerage. So we are in the middle. Okay. All right. At the bottom of page 11, established explanation procedure must be followed. Well, it just says that uh, we should have proper procedures in place to renew the policy. The customer should be given enough number of days for them to give an opportunity to shop around if they don't want to stay with us and all of that. Okay. And the, somebody should control the whole process. Page number 12. At the top, brokerage support staff organization. Sales are the lifeblood of the insurance brokerage. So you need to have a very robust sales department, right? And the marketing and sales don't go together. And you need to get, uh, you know, because there's so much competition going on. There's so many companies trying to sell business insurance policies. So you need to have a robust, uh, good, qualified salespeople. Well, no two insurance brokerages are identical. All have similar administrative system requirement. I mean, the brokerages, they may not be exactly the same, but then when you come to see what they do, they do the marketing, they contact the client, maybe they're using social media to advertise their product, and then they have a process to collect the information from the client. They Either they go and meet them personally or they do online, whatever it is. That cannot be so different from brokerage to brokerage because they're selling insurance, they're discussing coverages, discussing endorsements and all of that. It cannot be different, okay? That's what they're trying to say here. So task analysis, most brokerage perform similar tasks and services and by creating a list of these employees will have to clear picture uh, of what must be done, have a clear picture of what must be done. Meaning that the people working the brokerage, so let's say we have technical support reps, we have sales brokers, we have service brokers, we have processors to make, uh, you know, do changes. They all know, I train them all. I'm the only trainer in our brokerage. So I train them all in what they're supposed to do. A sales broker is doing something totally different compared to a service broker who make changes to the policy. So they all have their own set of uh, uh, thing that they know how to do. And they all do it like different things, okay? And also grouping of tasks, uh, I'm not going to spend so much time here. Every company, they have their own style. Okay. For example, some companies, they are so big, like Aviva, Intact, you know, they're so big. So they have underwriting department for different lines. They call monoline underwriters. So automobile underwriting is done by a group of people, just automobile, homeowners, specialty lines, commercial. So they have all these groups of people sitting and doing just, you know, a different thing. In small companies, small brokerages uh, and companies, they may have a multi-line underwriter because they don't have so many clients and they have a group of underwriters. They can take any call, automobile, property, tenant, condo, specialty line, commercial, they, you know, they're called multi-line. It depends. It depends on what kind of setup they want in that particular company. Uh, and so uh, delegation of authority, the concept of de delegating a partially based on the assumption that the person to whom the task is delegated had the ability and willingness to perform the task. A simple example is that let's say you are going on vacation and you're doing a lot of things on a daily basis, but you know, you're going for like a month. So what are you going to do? You're going to stop everything and then you go and then you come back and resume it. No, it won't work. Okay. There's so many moving parts in, in companies. So you have to delegate what you're doing to others. You have to train them. Okay, well enough so that they don't make mistakes because this will be your name under the on the line because you train them, it's your work. 
So when you come back, you don't want a big uh, plate full of headaches, right? So you train them and also the other person you're delegating to, they should be willing. They should be willing to take it on and help you, okay? Very important. And then the, uh, the last paragraph on page 12, coordination of job positions, proper workflow and communication among among the various people. So, you know, you you have so many different people working in a brokerage or insurance company. You have underwriters, you have brokers, you have technical support people. They all should work together, okay? Sometimes they have to share information together, okay? They should work together. That's all they're saying. There should be a, a nice flow of communication, okay? Now, on page 13, methods of organizing the staff. I just actually mentioned this. Either you can have monoline underwriters, okay, the line of business. Okay, let's have a group of people only working on automobile. Another group of people, property. Another one, condo. Another one, commercial. So when you have commercial, there are so many. Automobile fleet or, you know, it could be commercial property, commercial liability, directors and officers insurance or errors and omission. There's so much going on. So you can have a group of people for each of them. This line of business or the function. So let's have an underwriting department. All underwriting for all the lines we sell will go to this one department. According to the function, accounting, all accounting will go to the accounting department, sales, whatever it is. So it all depends on the company. There's no that everybody's following the same method. No. Okay. The line of business division of responsibility. I'm on page 13. So division of responsibility by the line of business characteristically results in two processing departments, personal lines and commercial lines. Okay. This is two big divisions within the insurance, our industry. Our industry is called property and casualty. So it, it, it has two big um, divisions personal line and commercial line. Okay. So as the brokerage pursues other areas such as life insurance, like in our brokerage, we also sell life insurance. Okay. Um, I'm not dealing with life insurance. I think in our head office, they, they do life insurance. Uh, in fact, I just had a call for yesterday from a, one of our managers. He was telling me that they'll be training, uh, three-day training, uh, because we're going to sell travel insurance in our brokerage also. So training will be, uh, he gave me the dates, actually February 21st and 28th and March 3rd. So I have to travel, drive down to Richmond Hill, which is about an hour and a half drive uh, from, from where I live. So I'll go there and uh, get trained there because I'm a trainer. So it's like training the trainer. <laughs> and there'll be a group of managers also in the training. So it's going to be fun because this is the first time after three years, I'm actually going to the head office uh, and I haven't seen those people in ages because of COVID. It's just absolutely crazy because I used to go there very often. It's a beautiful drive um, on the 407 highway, uh, just going there. So I always used to enjoy that drive, early morning drive and I missed that with COVID. But anyway, we are actually back to a lot of normal things are going on now. All right. So... Um, Line of, line of business divisions of commercial and personal line, we saw that. Yeah, the reason I was mentioning about that is that uh, some companies, they want to branch out into life insurance and other things. The advantage of organizing by line of business is that it follows natural dividing lines of the insurance business, but the disadvantage is that it may create a duplication of functions. Because see, a line of business, let's say you take automobile, so they have the underwriting, claims, and everything. Okay. And then you go to another line. You have another group of people like property. They also have underwriting and claims, you know, all of that. So here, then you're duplicating it. Why don't you then have function, you know, uh, underwriting all goes to one underwriting department. Automobile, property, commercial, everything together. I mean, if it works, if it works for a company, yeah, why not? Again, like I said, it's not like everybody follow the same, okay? And so function, functional division of responsibility, workflow can also be divided by function. We, say, we saw that before. Uh, you could have functions like sales, marketing, underwriting, new business. All these are functions. So you can have a group of people by function sitting there separately. So at the end, it says at the bottom of page 13, there's no single proper system. <laughs> That's what we've been saying all along, okay? It just depends on the company, how they want to run it. 
I'm on page 14 at the top here, insurance agency broker contracts. So remember I said to you a few minutes ago, if you are a broker and you want to work with a brokerage or you want to work with an insurance company, then you go and sit with them and you do an agency agreement. It's called an agency broker contract. So it'll depend on the commission, are you going to be paid a salary or uh, what will be your functions and what if you want to leave them, how much notice you have to give them, all. It's like an employment contract. But in the industry, in our industry, we call it as agency broker contract, okay? So it just they cover a couple of things here. They tell you what it includes. Um, broker authority. I'll give you a quick example. So if you're new, then especially if you don't have much experience, your authority to uh, to accept business will be a little bit limited. For example, uh, the insurance company will say, okay, you don't confirm coverage with the clients, but just fill out the application, collect all the information because you're so new and then send it to the underwriting department and we will take a look at it. So that means you don't have any authority to write business. But then if you are, we've been in the industry for a couple of years and people, they know you, uh, your company people, they know, then they may give you authority, okay, you can confirm coverage for a home for up to half a million dollars. Maybe a senior broker, yeah, he can confirm, he or she can confirm coverage up to a million dollars. So that is called binding authority, okay? So as we go along, what I'm going to do is to just um, give you my own little explanation and you can just check also what's written in the book, okay? And also, the, usually the insurance company, they create their rules by which they will accept the risk or reject the risk. And the broker has to be given those rules and they have to get familiar with that. So we are working with about 25 companies. Can you imagine how many rules that we have to know? Our brokers, okay? Yeah, it's a lot. And so ownership of expiration. Remember, we, we, we mentioned the word expiration list. That means the policies that expire. So they use the same word for the whole book of business. Okay, so let's say we just hired a broker uh, two weeks ago, and then she has a few million dollar worth of business that she has been collecting for many years. And then now she wants to join our brokerage. So we will discuss that, whether she wants to give all that expiration list, all the, the list of customers to us, or she wants to keep it for herself. Okay, this will be negotiated. Because let's say if she wants to leave our brokerage, uh, it depends on what they agreed before, whether she will leave all the clients behind for us or she will take her clients with her. Okay, so it's, there's no one uh, way of doing it. It all depends on uh, what they agree. So whenever you hear the words, uh, the owning the expiration list, mean the, the list of client, that's all it is. I don't know why they call expiration list. I, I never like that. Is the list of clients, that's all it is, okay? The expiration refers to the when the policy expires. Okay, billing procedure. Uh, the normal procedure is for the brokerage to identify all accounts due within a specific period, usually one month. I mean, in any company that you're running, you know, you need to have a billing procedure. When you sell a policy or you sell a product to a customer, how do you collect the premium? Are you going to then pay it monthly, month by month? Or are you going to take it one shot? Okay. So insurer statement with this remittance method, the insurer build the brokerage for the amounts. So sometimes the insurance company will tell the brokerage, okay, you guys don't deal with collecting the money. We will do that. Okay. So you just get out, get the customers. We'll pay you the commission. And then we will issue the policy and we will collect the money directly. In some cases, so we have a few companies, they asked us, the brokerage, to collect the money from the insured, whether it's a renewal premium or a first time or whatever it is, and give it to the insurance company. Okay, so it could go either way. I'm on page 15. Uh, so yeah, page 15 at the top, direct bill is the insurance company will correct it directly. The client is billed directly by the insurer. Okay, so bypassing the brokerage entirely. So the brokerage has got nothing to do with the collecting the money because the insurance companies have had bad experience with that. <laughs> the brokerage collecting the money and then they do something else with the money, they delay it and everything. And <laughs> most of the insurance company we are dealing with like over 95%, they said, 
don't worry about the money, guys, okay? You just get at the customers. We will collect the money directly. That's called direct bill. Okay. And the commission, I'm on page 15. Commissions uh, schedules may vary between insurers. What the commission we're talking about? Remember the brokerage like where I work, we go to the market, we do the marketing, and we find the clients. And we send it to the insurance company. We do quotes with many companies and we find the best coverage and the best for best price and we give it to the client. So the company who got the business, they have to pay us commission. That's all it is, okay? So it depends uh, if it's an automobile, property, commercial, specialty lines, you know, what type of risk, the commission will be, could be different. This is here, the average commission is about 15%. And so the contract may also include a contingent profit or bonus commission. What is it? This one, in addition to the regular commission, let's say 15%, the insurance company will also give us an extra bonus or contingent commission if we, if the business we gave them exceeds the budget. Okay, in the beginning of the year, the insurance company gave us a budget. Okay, we, need, we are looking for like $10 million worth of coverage this year. So let's say we get, and if you guys go more than 10 million, uh, let's say you got 12 million uh, up to 15 million. We give you extra commission. So that's called contingent commission, okay? So another word you want to learn here is called the loss ratio. <clears throat> so the loss ratio is how much money we collected from the customers in terms of premium and how much we paid out in terms of claim. So obviously, if you're running an insurance company, you want to pay out less than what you collect. Because if you're paying more in claims and you're collecting less premium, you're going to go bankrupt very soon, <laughs> right? That's not going to work in the long run. So the loss ratio should be less than 100%. Okay, anything more than 100%, what they're doing. So let's say your loss ratio is uh, intact loss ratio. Uh, last month I was reading it. Intact is Canada's largest uh, insurance company. Maybe you're listening to this from a different country. Intact Insurance is Canada's largest company, and they have like 32% market share. So they lost ratio, I think about 86%. What exactly it means? That means for every dollar of premium they made from the client, the income, they spend 86 cents in terms of claim payment. So they made a profit, like 14 cents profit on the every dollar. So that translated to, in three months, Intact made $1.6 billion. Uh, profit in three months. In the, I think the three months of the last quarter or the second quarter of 2022, I'm talking about, after they took over RSA, a big company takeover, they made their loss ratio actually went down. They made, they did better and they made a $1.6 billion profit just in three months. Okay. So you get the idea. The loss ratio is how much money you make from the customers and how much you paid out. That the difference. Okay. Expenses, of course. You know, there's a lot of different expenses. There are no set rules, <clears throat> okay? It depends on the agency agreement. Sometimes the insurance company will pick up some of the expenses of the brokerage. It depends. Termination. If the brokerage wants to secede, leave the insurance company, they have to give notice. So again, there's no uh, standard rule for this. It could be 90 days, 180 days, or it could be 30 days, whatever it is, okay? Other provisions... I'm on page at the bottom of page 15. To protect the brokers from responsibility for the acts of the insurer, the agency broker contract should include a clause in which the insurance company indemnifies and holds the broker harmless. So let's say, for example, the broker was the one dealing with the customer, and then the, he went to an insurance company, got a policy set up, and now something went wrong, and the customer is now suing the broker. The customer was affected, but the mistake was made by the insurance company. So in order to avoid such a situation, the brokerage will insist that the insurance company include a clause in the agency agreement that if and when something goes wrong and the brokerage being blamed, but the actual problem was created by the insurance company, they made the mistake, so they have to take care of it. They will hold the broker harmless. They will protect the broker and then they will take the you know the blame for it and they will handle it, okay? This is the, just the other provision. And then I'm on page 16 here. 
departments of an insurance company, this is very uh, simple. I'm not going to spend too much time here because many departments of the insurance company, they are very similar to other companies. You may have worked in other companies, not insurance. You're just coming into insurance. That's why you're learning Rebo. Let's say a company has uh, HR, administration, um, you know, all the uh, the thing, uh, office administration and sales and things like that. They cannot be very different. But there are some unique departments. Okay, anyway, on page 16, they actually list them, like human resources, HR, legal department, uh, materials management, management information, computer system, computer department. They cannot be different. They are all the same uh, in, in many companies. But then insurance company, they have claims. Okay, claims department. Uh, they are very unique to the insurance uh, uh, companies. And uh, there's a few words here at the bottom of page 16. It says, for obvious reason, the consumer's uh, to consumer, this is the most important department in any insurance company. The claims department is responsible to see that all valid insurance losses are investigated. Why it is so important for the customers? Because they keep on paying the premium month after month, year after year. And when they make a claim, something happened to their home or maybe they had an accident with a car. They look to the claims department to process it fast and efficient and pay them the money and everything as soon as possible. Okay, so that's why it's very, very important department. Okay, claims department. Finance is the same, marketing, very uh, same with the other companies. Underwriting is different because underwriting uh, very unique to insurance companies. This department is responsible to develop proper statistics to enable the company to price the insurance products properly, meaning that they will keep an eye on the loss ratio. They'll collect a lot of statistics about the claims being paid out and then uh, the money we are making. Not only that, they'll also look at many other things, the inflation, the competition, and so on and so forth, okay? So they have that duty. They'll work with the actuaries, risk management professionals, and then the top officials in the company, okay? So develop proper statistics and also to ensure that the premium charged by the company is adequate. So when you're selling insurance, you cannot just lower the price too much to get more customers, though you'll be incurring a lot of losses, okay? So it has to be a balance. So they will decide how, also you have to look at the competition, you cannot be too high with your price, you'll lose customers, okay? So it's a balancing act. Page 18 is just a word about reinsurance. So the reinsurance means, let's say intact, Canada's largest company. So they go to the public through brokerages, okay? And they got the customer there. Let's say they have 1 million customers for homeowners. What they're going to do, they're not going to keep all their business for themselves. Pretty much all the company, they do this practice. So they will take, let's say, 20, 30, 40% of what they accepted from the public and they send it to another company called reinsurance company. So that's called a transferring the risk. Why? Because let's say there's a catastrophic event happen and all the people are making claims. So if the insurance company kept everything for themselves, they may not have enough money. And some company, they made that mistake and they went bankrupt. They couldn't handle the claims. So it's a good idea to share the risk that you accepted from the public with another company called reinsurer. You transfer some. So when the claim comes in, you, you know, you make a phone call to the uh, reinsurance company and say, hey guys, we gave you 40% of this risk. So you also have to take over the 40% of the claim. Okay, so you're not doing everything on your own. Sometimes it'll be impossible, okay? And then the reinsurance company, they do the same thing. They also take a portion of the, uh, the risk they accepted from the other companies. Then they also get sent to another reinsurance company. So they are called retrocessionaire. Okay, the first one is called retrocession. Okay, the company transferring a portion of that to the reinsurance company and the reinsurance company also transfer their risk, a portion of that to take another company that's called retrocession, okay? Uh, retrocessionaire and retrocession. So why reinsurance? Here are the couple of reasons. Increased underwriting capacity. You see the government, 
when you want to apply for a license to open an insurance company, they're going to ask you to show you, show them the capital, how much you have. And you say, okay, I have $100 million. Okay, if you have $100 million, you can write automobile policy up to $50 million. That's it. So now you already exhausted $50 million, okay? But you have a lot of customers calling your company. They want to become your customer. They heard about you. They like your company and everything. But the problem is you cannot accept new customers because you already reached your capacity according to the government, according to the capital that you showed them. And you cannot go and get more money now. You're stuck. That's all you can borrow. Now, what you can do to accept more customers to increase capacity, you take 20, 30, 40% of this risk that you've accepted and give it to a reinsurance company. Now it opens up capacity. Okay, so increased underwriting capacity, maintain proper reserves. So what's a reserve? A reserve is, there are three types of reserve. I don't know if they discuss it very uh, detailed here, but let me just see. Premium capacity, the aggregate premium volume an insurer can safely write in a given accounting period. This capacity is limited by the insurance acts and generally accepted accounting principles. So I already mentioned that. The government will keep an eye on how much uh, capital you have and how much capacity, how much capacity means how much business you can accept from the public. Financial analysts generally consider an insurer to be overextended if its written premium exceeds the policyholder surplus by more than some specific ratio. So you shouldn't be pushing your company to the limit by keep on accepting more business. That's what it says here. Okay, so the government, they have all the measurements, how much assets you have, how much business you accepted, and when you need to stop accepting more business. And they will tell you. Okay, don't accept any more business, right? So after you accept the business, you have to set aside money as a reserve. What if a loss happened? Somebody's home is burned down. You have to have the money ready. So that's called a reserve, okay? And the surplus, the word surplus means you are making uh, money from your business and you set aside a certain amount of money. For example, if your loss ratio is good, you're paying out uh, less claim than the money you're making, then the extra money you keep it as a surplus. So the government will also look at your surplus. Okay, that's the meaning of surplus. So now we are on page 19. Oh, the continuation of the Y reinsurance. To maintain proper reserve, the second point on page 18, the bottom of page 18, I already mentioned it to you. Uh, the reserve, you have to have enough reserve compared to how much business you accepted, right? So if you don't have enough reserve for whatever reason, you don't have the money to set aside and the government is uh, calling you, they're complaining, then you limit the exposure that you accepted. You take a portion of that and send it to the reinsurance company. So that means now you can show enough reserve to the government because you took a part of your business, gave it to a reinsurance company, for which you don't have to have reserve because you already gave it to reinsurance. And for the rest, whatever reserve you have, it's enough. Okay, so this is kind of balancing, maintaining a proper reserve. So the catastrophe protection, you know, you heard about the ice storm and wind, you know, all this big uh, hurricanes, uh, forest fires, these are catastrophes. Thousands of people are affected and people are losing everything. And so insurance companies get thousands of claims like Hurricane Ian happened like a, a month ago in Florida. Just say it's a $110 billion claim, okay? It's huge, huge destruction. So the problem is if you're going to keep all the risk that you took from the public for yourself, and when a catastrophe hits like that, you have to pay yourself the whole thing. But when you, let's say you were very uh, wise enough and you took 40% of that and you gave it to a reinsurance company, then now you only have to worry about 60% of that risk, that loss. You go to the reinsurance and uh, make a claim for 40%. So it provides you uh, protection uh, of, uh, during a catastrophe. Next one, I'm on page 19. Retirement from a class of uh, business. So this is if an insurer might decide to withdraw from a particular class of its insurance activities because now working for them, 
it might stop writing new policies and also relieve itself of liabilities under existing policies. An insurance company can obtain reinsurance to avoid incurring ill will, adverse publicity, and perhaps lawsuits by simply canceling its policies. So basically what they're saying here, under retirement from a class of business, let's say you are an insurance company and then you're operating in uh, in Alberta, in the province of Alberta, and then you're selling uh, some coverage, either automobile or business uh, insurance, whatever it is. But then you find out you're not making profit. It's not working for you. But then you already sold your policy to tens of thousands of clients. They already have it, okay? So what will happen is if you just tell your customers, oh, okay, we are going to stop this business because it's not making any profit. So starting next week, this, we no longer sell the business. But what about the customer who already purchased the policy? What if they have a claim? So what you can do is you can go to a reinsurance company and you can let them take over the whole book of business. Okay, it's called, the process is called runoff. Okay, it's called runoff, the whole process of transferring all the business so that the public, they don't know that they're not going to have a policy soon because you're pulling out of the province and it's a chaos. Okay, if they go back to them, they will never like to deal with you because you just give them like a sudden shock. So in order to avoid that, you can actually deal with the reinsurance company and transfer all these policies to them Okay, and classification. Reinsurance contract can be classified according to the following two characteristics. How they describe the way in which insurance is to be placed and how they apportion the obligations and the premium received between the insurer and the reinsurer. So here is uh, examples. Regarding the first characteristic, which is how they decide the way in which insurance to be placed, reinsurance contracts are either treaty or facultative. So what's a treaty? A treaty is for, you know, like automobile, property, some similar risk. So we will enter into a treaty with the reinsurance company for like a year and then renewable by every year, okay? So what that means is the risk, let's say we, we have an automobile antique and classic. Let me go with the example of antique and classic. So we have automobile business and under the automobile business, we have commercial auto, personal auto, antique and classic vehicles. So your company decide that, you know what, we're not doing so well with the Antique and Classic. Why don't we take the whole book of business of Antique and Classic and give it to a reinsurance company on a treaty? Like let's enter into a treaty for one year and then uh, we can renew it next year. So what happens is when a new customer calls you to insure an Antique and Classic vehicle, you will automatically transfer that risk to the reinsurance company where you have a treaty. Okay, they cannot refuse it. They, they have to accept that because that's the treaty, okay? So a treaty is a long-term, but the facultative is for very complex risks. Let's say, you know, a company is riding a risk of offshore oil rig or like a huge complicated something, okay? Then it's not going to be a treaty. We're going to treat that on a case-by-case -case basis. So let's say the offshore oil rig so you contact the reinsurance company and say, hey guys, would you like to take a look at this risk? Because we are about to take it over. It's worth like $150 million. Would you be interested in it? So they may come and they look at the risk and then they may say, no, we don't want a part of this. No, this is too complicated. You know, we had bad problem with this oil rigs. So we're not interested. They can say that. So that is called a, facultative reinsurance. It's on a case-by-case -case basis for high value item, very complex risk, okay? But the treaty is just for things that are similar like automobile, property, okay? We can easily get into a treaty. Actually, you know what? Oh, the, the final one is proportional and non-proportional. I'm on the bottom of page 19. Proportional means, let's say intact have a uh, $100 million worth of risk they've taken over from the public and they take 30% of that and they transfer it to a reinsurance company. So if it's on a proportional basis, then Intact will also be responsible for the similar same 30% of the losses. And also the Intact has to transfer 30% of the premium they receive from the you know uh, client to the reinsurance company. Everything, the same percentage. 30% in my example, average should be 30%, okay? That's called proportional. 
the non-proportional, uh, the works is the, the front-end company like Intact, they will, they will set a limit. Okay, they'll set a limit that we will be, re we will be responsible for up to this limit. Anything above that limit, the client is making a claim above that limit, which was preset, anything above that, it'll go to the reinsurance company. That's non-proportional, okay? So it says here at the bottom of page 19, which is the last page here for us, in non-proportional, the reinsurer bears the, only the upper portion of the large losses. The bottom portion is already predefined, okay? And that'll be kept for the, handled by the primary insurance company like Intact. Anything above that, it'll be handled by the insurance company, uh, sorry, the reinsurer, okay? It's called non-proportional. We don't use a percentage in the in the non-proportional, okay? We just set a limit and anything above that limit, we will send it to you guys, to a reinsurance company and you handle that, okay? Okay, my friends, so, I'm going to end the recording here. I'm going to upload it to YouTube and hopefully uh, this is much better than the, the previous recording that I did. Okay. Thank you, everyone. I'll see you in chapter two.